All right, here we go, you gorgeous accursed. Jordan Leitnitz is here. Corey Tank is here. Scott Reed, proud father of North Toronto under 14 select Harrington Tournament champion Ben is here. And me, David Hurley, I'm here. Scott, what's that all about? Oh, the boys had to go to uh, Buffalo. The big Gene here. I'm sure you've heard of the Gene Harrington Tournament, of course. It draws attention from all across North America. Teams from Florida, Pennsylvania, and California even. There were kids from Las Vegas standing in the snow yesterday acting like they had landed on Mars. So that was fun. Then the boys, uh, we ended up, we go all the way there. We're in a tournament. Uh, it's been three days there. And then we square off against a team that's in our own league in North Toronto and beat them for the gold. How many beer does it take to get through a hockey tournament in Buffalo? Uh, well, the uh, the stats aren't in uh, completely. There was one goal, one assist, and at last count, 31 pints of Budweiser. But, I was going to say, I'm, um, I imagine it varies depending uh, on the beer, American or Canadian, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, it's advanced analytics. There's quite a bit more data to be collected and analyzed. <laughs> All right, there's lots of big hairy topics on today's agenda that are sure to put the cuss in our discussion today. The emerging health care deal between the feds and the provinces and the political implications of more private delivery. And if we get through that and we're still speaking to each other, we will talk about the feds just transition plan for the oil patch and how it's given Danielle Smith a new lease on life. And then it's our cursed clipping, Aaron Wary's piece on cbc.ca, Justin Trudeau's put up or shut up moment as he looks toward 2025. And after we've spent all of our energy on all that, Gordon Pinsent will drop by to revive us for a rousing set of hey yous. Scott, Jordan, Corey, you're all good? We're all good. Wow. I'm good anyway. Yeah, I'm feeling Jordan, give me a little detail about your weekend. You, you were not what? in Buffalo. We were not in Buffalo, uh, although we did some family skating as well. There's this uh, there, there's this really cute place outside of Ottawa where they have uh, like this creek that they freeze through like orchards and like it's like a skating path. Montreal? And Are you talking about Montreal? No, no. There's one in Ottawa. Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm at the yeah, city of Montreal. Montreal isn't, you're right. Yeah, oh, that was good. I caught that now. Yeah, so it was really fun. So we did that with my family. And like big news in our house is my five-year-old has like actually figured out how to skate not through any like education on my part because that's clearly not my thing but we just kind of put him on skates and put him on the ice long enough that he like deduced how to do it so i'm feeling like a plus parenting right on. <laughs> wow you're pretty much done yeah i know yeah. right what else yeah. like, that's All right. it right just flip Tell the keys stuff. to him and he's off <laughs> okay cool we're good <laughs> oh my god the tears in buffalo yesterday must have been something so uh my oldest son jack went to the game and he was all excited because tickets dropped, eh? Ticket prices dropped for that game. It made no sense for the last four days. So he finally said, to hell with that. I'm just going to go. So he went to the game, was all excited, and then they just got pounded. Yeah, it was ugly. Yeah. Dominated. Sorry, Buffalo fans. It was a physical beating. Uh, all right. Let's get to it. Let's move to Let's start with Alberta and oh. talk about the just transition. Premier Smith is up in arms about an internal federal government memo that discusses what kind of jobs are at risk from the energy transition. She claims that the government is intending to eliminate those jobs, all 2.7 million of them, and it must be getting traction because opposition leader Notley has joined in her outrage about this just transition plan. Corey, start with you if I could. How does a reasonable idea that some people are going to be negatively affected by a government policy and should therefore there should be adjustment help for those people. How does that become politically toxic? Well, when you're planning to lay off uh, and dislocate that many people from someone's economy, don't expect to thank you when you when you roll out the plan for it. Like, I, I think it's fairly obvious. But, you know, I think I think the whole policy speaks to what's so wrong headed. Uh, about uh, the climate plan for this government. Like, if if you accept that, that climate change is, is a problem uh, and a big problem, which I think everyone on this on this podcast does, and, you know, most Canadians, if you're to poll and ask them, that's fine. But you got to think that it's a global problem, too. And this is about reducing global carbon emissions. And, you know, so if you're t talking about things like natural gas or, yeah, uh, and uh, the global carbon footprint, you know, lots of coal being burnt in, in places like China and overseas. 
uh, you know, energy shortages in Western Europe, our allies, etc. You know, there is a really reasonable case to be made for us actually increasing production of what is, by comparative uh, measure, cleaner energy than what is being used in parts of the world that it will displace. And I, okay, I, so, I wait, so what you're saying is to me is that the fight isn't about the just transition at all. It's that the just transition has reactivated the fight about the energy transition. I, I think so, but I think it, it, it speaks to where I think the fundamental difference in approach that, you know, uh, someone like Brad Wall, who I think you had a you know, really great conversation with on this very topic. Very interesting ideas about uh, On, on uh, the Hurley Burley, like, I don't think the objective for Canada should be net carbon neutrality. I think it should be about global carbon reduction and getting cleaner energy to places in the world that are using dirtier energy. Uh, and there is a way for Canada to increase its jobs in the energy sector and make the world's energy environment cleaner in the process. You know, we're not getting off, uh, you know, traditional uh, and carbon-based energies tomorrow. This is going to be a long process. And there is a lot of very dirty energy being used in other parts of the world. And Canada could pr provide uh, much cleaner energy to these places. And I, you know, I, that's not climate denialism. That's not any of that. You can be, you know, uh, very concerned about these things, as I think all of us are. Uh, and see the merit in that approach. So like, I, I, I think it's wrong-headed, but I also think just from, if you're asking just a pure politics, you know, why is this so toxic in, in Alberta for both, uh, you know, and, and being spoken out against by both uh, Daniel Smith and, and Rachel Notley, it's because it's a plan to uh, upend the economy of the province of Alberta and to a lesser extent, the province of Sask Saskatchewan. Uh, and, but it and isn't. For, but it, but Corey, sorry, it isn't. the The climate plan may be, the climate plan may be, but the just transition plan is not. So I'm well, just going to throw it there again. It's I pre was predicated on it. I was calling yeah. aggressively for this a couple of years ago because I feel strongly that if a certain region of the country is going to be economically disadvantaged because of a policy that is deemed to be in the national interest, then that consequence should be absorbed by the nation not by the region in which that's in which that's occurring so i have i was years ago on this show urging the feds to show some sensitivity to the implications of the policy that they that they were having so now they've come out with this now admittedly just transition is a lousy name for a lot of reasons and i don't know why they're still using it because i've had two or three ministers on this show tell me that they hated the term wilkinson told me that regan or regan told me that um, so I don't know why they're still using it, but nonetheless, the fact that, and Scott, maybe you can help me here. The fact that whether it's government policy or whether it's international trend lines, the story is that there's going to be less oil and gas developed in 20 years than there is today. So why is it unpopular to be planning to actually pump money into the Alberta economy to, uh, to support the people who are going to be disadvantaged by that? Well, I think there's a couple of things there. Um, uh, I don't agree with a lot of what Corey said, just to put it, uh, I, to put it uh, hard. Uh, like, I really do. Like, this idea of, listen, you can go cheat on your husband and have him like it. You can go through a global energy transition of this kind and find ways to increase the number of jobs in the energy sector in Canada. Let's not bullshit ourselves, all right? This is coming at a cost. It's going to have a real cost. Corey's correct when he says that's going to have unpleasant political consequences, um, but let's not let's not pretend that we can say, listen, we all agree that climate change is real and we ought to do something about it, but we shouldn't do this thing that actually confronts the reality of it. We ought to pretend that we can wait for the rest of the world, particularly the dirty parts of the world, to do something, do everything, and then we'll follow suit. And by the way, we can make it a net positive. We're not going to make it a net positive. It's going to be an enormously taxing, difficult, challenging transition, and it's going to cost uh, real, real uh, people, real, real consequences. I think there's two or three big problems with the way that the government's positioned this. First of all, I, I you mentioned in passing, I don't think it can be mentioned in passing. Just transition isn't a bad title. It's a disastrous, galling, angering, red flag to a bull title because it's loaded with the, like it's utterly enwrapped in this sort of, superior smug sense of you are going to experience a transition it's going to suck for you 
We, however, are going to come to your rescue because we are enlightened. We are distant from the pain that you will experience, and we will make it just. It is just that you suffer. It is it is right that you be nailed to this cross, but our sins will be washed away as a consequence. Now, we're going to use wood nails, not metal. That's going to make it better for you. It's just so, so wildly offensive, like inherently. And if you can't see that, um, you talk. we talk about McKinsey, and we may talk about it again. We talk about these McKinsey contracts. We talked about the management consultant mentality. This is an example of management consultant mentality at its absolute 11th degree, the just transition. And people nod their head and go, yeah, that's great. That captures it perfectly. Fucking get out of the room if you think that captures it perfectly. You don't deserve to be in politics. The second thing is, it's happening now. I'm with you, David. I was talking about the same thing two years ago. I was saying, we need to get ahead of this. We need to say, listen, we are not going to permit this much more massive transition to occur in the same way that we watched on a, on a smaller scale, the codfish and the fishery uh, collapse in, in Newfoundland 30 years ago and, and sit back and not do anything. We're going to actually get ahead of this. We're going to put in a, a like fundamental adjustment levers. And I think one of the problems that reminds us of a core principle is don't, don't promise something. Don't talk about something. Don't plan and plan and tinker and wait. Do something. Do something first and then tell people what it is. But when you tell people, good news, we have a just transition for you and this is what it's all about, then, um, you know, that you give yourself nothing to work for. And the final thing is you have to recognize who you are and who they are. And in this case, I don't mean they, the people of Alberta, or those that are working in Saskatchewan, Alberta, Newfoundland, and elsewhere in the energy sector. I mean the premier of Alberta and who you are. Who you are as a federal government means that you got to recognize that your motives will be suspect, your values will be suspect on this issue, and you have to move ahead accordingly and message and think about that accordingly. Um, it starts with get a better label, obviously. But then you also have to know that your policies are going to be mischaracterized in the, and, and flat out lied about. So when, you know, Danielle Smith, I mean, the most obvious thing, she says that it's going to cost 2.7 million. They're coming for 2.7 million jobs. There are 2.7 million jobs in the entirety of Alberta. It's, I mean, the, the, you know, so you put yourself in a position where you're going to be victim to this kind of misinformation and disinformation, and you know that's going to happen. So if you know that's going to happen, Proceed accordingly. Plan two steps ahead. Think about what you say, how you say it, where you're going to say it, what your memos do say and don't say, right? And I just think there's just a lack of EQ around this from top to bottom. I'll stop ranting now. No, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Scott is saying, although I think the idea, part of the problem is that energy workers in Alberta and, and, and people in Alberta are tired of having things done to them. And I think that that's actually just like the nut of it right there. And why this is an interesting story for me, completely apart from the policy debate, which you can just be assured that I really disagree with Corey. Um, but, but apart, but the politics of it is that this is a, this is a government that just has not taken in these lessons that has not learned about the, the bitter, disconnect that people in the prairies are feeling from them and is really making no systemic effort to address that. Like, just as an example, the repeated use of the dress transition terminology, you know, David, as you say, like ministers have been talking about how they dislike that for months, if not years. I can remember, you know, like reaching far back as like 2018, even among progressives, you know, there was a climate group that did something in Alberta called, you know, the Alberta Narratives Project, where they sat down with energy workers and found out that lo and behold, people hate just transition. And like, so there's been a lot of information out there for a very long time in the public domain, even about why this is the absolute wrong language to learn. And yet, and yet, it keeps creeping in to get... Yeah, like, and if it was that clear in Quebec or Ontario, they wouldn't right. miss would, it, it would, right? It would they stop. wouldn't miss it. Yeah. So, Right now, like to me, there's something just like not buttered to the edges about about what's going on in inside the minister's office, inside the government on this. It's not seen as a powerful enough of a problem to do the work to shift that language. And that's an issue. The other thing I think that, you know, we have to also look at 
track record and trust and some of the reasons why the liberals will not be heard charitably ever in the prairies on this stuff. And particularly in Alberta, there's a really recent case in point. So you want to talk even about just transition. Well, so the, the model that we have in Canada is the just transition for coal workers, right? So this was done a few years ago that, you know, the government brought together labor industry and they did a ton of work and they made a ton of recommendations that are now sitting on a shelf. So if you're in Alberta, and even if you want to charitably believe that the federal government is going to provide some sort of structured assistance to you and your community, whatever, through what's going down, you immediately have proof points that that's not an urgent problem, that, that that's not something that they are on top of. So I find I find the debate uh, surprising because because the government could be doing easy things internally to tighten up the communications on this. And even if you listen to Danielle Smith, like one of the first things out of her mouth is how liberals in Ottawa talk about these jobs as dirty. And, and like that is, that resonates for people, right? And, and the problem is, is that when you listen, you know, when you listen to the Trudeau government talk about energy workers, that is the impression that you have is that they think these jobs are, are fundamentally not good, right? And so that is not a great place. There's just, there's no effort to connect. And I think that that sets them on their back feet right from the start. And and then that combined with just not tightening up internally, um, yeah, you're going to be, deli- guess what? You're going to be deliberately misread in these places. And that's exactly what's going on right here. I think in part, it's an example of one of Hurley's rules of politics, which is don't solve a problem that people don't yet know exists. Um, and so... Uh, you get no credit for introducing a solution to a problem that isn't yet apparent to people. And so while the Trudeau government may accept that many people in the oil patch are going to lose their jobs, the people of Alberta haven't accepted that many people in Alberta are going to lose their jobs. And they're talking at them and not Mm. with them. Well, it's also a disastrously bad policy. Like, let's not, uh, let's not uh, pretend uh, or be naive that if you knock 10 points off the GDP of Canada, which is about what the energy industry is in our economy, Uh, You're not going to have any fucking money uh, to just transition anyone. You're not going to have money for universal health care, which we're going to be talking about shortly. You're going to have a lot of money for a whole lot of other things that you say you want to do. So let's just be realistic about what we're talking about here. It is just stupid. It's not a just transition. It's just fucking stupid. But you can't say that. You can't can't say that, Corey, and then also say, but obviously there is a global transition occurring here and we have to transition. And and you can't say that. What you just said, listen, if we want to maximize, we want to maximize GDP and make certain that we don't take any kind of economic haircut then you say well then we do nothing with respect to climate change no and no, you ignore no, those targets no, but well that's no, a logical extension no, of what you're no, saying I mean, I find is, no, but that's not at all what I'm, it's not at all what i'm saying what if I'm Corey's saying is, echoing brad wall if Corey's echoing brad wall he's saying don't focus on reducing emissions in canada which are marginal globally Focus on reducing emissions in other countries. Give them it, nuclear it, it, reactors so that they can get off them, of coal. Give them, get, give them cleaner energy. <laughs> what is better for uh, to send uh, uh, LNG to Asia and uh, and displace dirty coal? You know, we send a lot of coal but to Asia it, still today it, it, too. I don't know if you know that. Here's an existential podcasting question for you, Hurley Burleyites: Is a podcast still a podcast if nobody's listening? I ask it semi-seriously, recognizing that in the early days of this show in 2017, nobody was listening. But that was their choice. And I'm damn grateful for the audience we've built in five and a half years. What happens when it's not a choice? More than ever before, there are extreme, sometimes catastrophic weather events that threaten connectivity. But our presenting sponsor, TELUS, thinks and acts differently when it comes to network resiliency and reliability. It's part of their culture from an investing billions of dollars to build their network differently point of view, and from a humans pulling out all the stops to keep other humans connected in an emergency point of view. I want to focus here on one important way they build differently. Unlike some other carriers, TELUS has committed to fiber optic cables, replacing the older copper ones. Close to 70% of their network is now served by fiber. Their aim is to be 100% copper free. Copper may be cheaper, but fiber is just better in every way. It's faster and far more efficient at transferring huge amounts of data over longer distances, making it easier to do everything online all at once. Fiber is stronger and more durable. 
The optic strands don't degrade like copper and they're incredibly weather resistant, so they can withstand storms and extreme weather events. Flooding or heavy rain will not impact their ability to provide connectivity. They won't corrode, break or short out like copper will. Fiber is not susceptible to signal interference or data errors like copper is. There's just more resilience and reliability wound up in every strand of Telus' fiber cable, Hurley Burleyites. And more story to tell here. Tune in next week. In, in any event, in any event, I, and I remain the chair of this podcast, did not want to talk about climate policy today. I wanted to talk about the politics of Hold this transition act, uh, and we have, I think, well, canvassed it. Wait, but I, mean, I, I think there's one aspect of it that we haven't touched on yet, and, and, and Jordan, maybe you could just jump in here, is what is Notley's position? Like, what is her situation in which she feels that she has to navigate right now? Well, so she, she has to appear as enthusiastic a defender of Alberta jobs as Danielle Smith. And I think like we did see a very clear shift in her messaging towards the end of this week where, you know, she came more squarely after Trudeau and even after Singh's climate targets. And I think, you know, I think she's doing what she's got to do. I think she's doing it well. She's talking about pulling back on that legislation uh, on a on a consultation basis, basically that the, the Liberals have not done enough consultation with the people of Alberta. Fine, but you know, if you look back at her comments for the last couple of weeks, she's also out there really arguing for more money for Alberta through this process. Um, and so I think you know she's she's staying in that discussion, uh, but she's doing what she needs to do to not give Danielle kind of a clear a clear and open territory on this. Yeah, surely she's prepared to sacrifice some enthusiasm from climate voters in Alberta in order to maintain the middle class base of... I think that climate voters in Alberta uh, also have a track record of hers to point to that they can feel confident that as premier, she actually has done the tough work to take some action. And that's what we saw in her last term. It's the only, right? it's the only rational position. She can hardly <laughs> hug a, pe- uh, a pillow that's crocheted just transition and say, but I'll do it different. <laughs> totally. um, th- I, I just want to go po- out and argue for more money when it's actually happening. Like that, like that's also, she's very pragmatic on that level. One other tiny thread that I promised David is not about policy. Um, just pure guts of government stuff. I like you am confused about the you I'm just harping and harping and harping on this label, but I'm confused about the use of the label because you talk about ministers who say, well, I want to eschew this label and all that. But I think maybe that highlights one of the other frustrations of being in government, no matter what party you are, which is I wonder if somebody somewhere had blessed this phrase and it now persists. Well, and it, it has comes a, from the Paris. It comes from the Paris Agreement. Right. So now it has a zombie-like sort of endurance within the bureaucracy. So, I mean, all of this was a briefing books for a cabinet retreat, I think, originally. Is that right? And so, yeah. you know, it's the kind of thing where, like, you have to, it happens, you're sitting in government and, you know, you're in the minister's office and the phone rings and they're asking about this A tip that just landed on their desk and labeled, labeled just transition. And then, you know, you go in to tell the minister, this is what we're going to have to deal with in scrums today. And the minister looks at you and turns purple and says, I thought we sent a note saying that fucking phrase was to be redacted, killed, crushed, wiped from existence. But no, no, people in the policy branch sort of think it's still like they like it because it sort of puts them in the swim of the international movement and all that sounds like cool. And, then, you know, so I just think there may be a little of that going on. Well, it, you, let's just be realistic, though, about how impossible it is to market market what they're trying to it's not like you change the name of this it's you know as the saying goes doesn't matter what uh, flavor your tub of ice cream is you mix a spoonful of shit into it guess what flavor ice cream you got now <laughs> you I, got know, I, know. I think cream. at the end of the day and Alberta's going to take bags I don't, of I don't think, I think it's going to happen regardless of what labels think, on them I don't think you can fix this I'm sorry there's no way to market something that is this repugnant to that part of the world. Like, it's well, just, at some it's point, fun. people will be demanding it's, it. It's, it's, it's the best. At some it's, point, it's, people will enough. be demanding it. Fair this enough. is it's the best the campaign manage- plan uh, since Tim Hudak promised to uh, fire uh, 100,000 workers, uh, government workers during a campaign. This is oh, that was a good idea. Terrible. That was a great, yeah, that, yeah, was, that a was a good, great. that, that was a good this day. Is, that was a rare is, good day for me and David. This is uh, ma- magnitudes uh, larger in terms of Take something like that for Scott and I to win the election. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, what's, what's so, uh, you know, I think going to be, uh, uh, you know, difficult for, for uh, some folks who are liberals in Ottawa to, uh, 
get their head around is I think they've done more to help uh, get uh, Daniel Smith uh, elected in the upcoming election than anything she could have ever done for herself. Like, I think they've thrown her a lifeline. Well, let's see. Well, let's move on to another topic to talk about how good the federal government is. And that's health care. So as the first ministers are getting closer to a deal, the elements of the deal are starting to emerge. Trudeau dropped what I consider to be a bombshell last week. In response to the Ford government's plan to use more private clinics to deliver procedures, Trudeau blew off 50 years of liberal policy and liberal positioning when he told Susan Delacourt that those are innovations and that he has no problem with them. So apparently the provinces are going to get a lot more flexibility in how they deliver services. My sense out there is that there's very little pushback uh, to it. I've been talking around to people over the weekend and I haven't found a lot of people that are as up in arms about this as as I am. And I don't know, don't know why because I had always thought this was very politically treacherous territory. Jordan, what have I gotten wrong about that? Oh, um, I mean, I think... I think maybe two things. Uh, so the first being that though it's maybe not well known, private delivery is a big part of the Canadian healthcare system already. And I think that the fact that people are maybe familiar with experiencing that and seeing that, like most people's family doctors, for example, are private. It's a private business, right? Um, so I think that there's a little bit of familiarity on it. And I think the second thing is, is that it's it's not yet evident what the impact is this going to be on public uh, health care delivery. And I think that that's one that is going to come out more in time. But certainly the concern is, or the risk on this, obviously, is that if you're just sucking staff from publicly funded facilities into these for-profit private facilities uh, without any kind of a health human resources plan, then at the end of the day, you're ac you actually could worsen uh, problems in the public facilities. So that's one that would take some time to appear. I think politically, um, this does a few things. I think that obviously this, this creates an opening for Singh, what Trudeau has said here, that he's just sort of hugging this. Um, and it allows the NDP to really paint themselves squarely on the side of public health care, which I think is quite good for them. That's that's a little a crisp division line that they haven't been able to have with the Liberals recently. And I think for Ford, though, this is not a move without risk. Um, if this gets branded as privatization more broadly, it could be very dangerous for him. A lot of this rests on how the public actually assimilates this and views this. And whether we see uh, some problems creep up with quality uh, or with within the public system afterwards. I think it's also very risky for Ford if it looks like this is another move to reward well-connected friends within the business community. Like if this is about, if this is sort of in the same vein as the Green Belt and his developer buddies, this is in the same vein with you know, COVID decisions and shoppers drug mart making lots of money on testing and things like that. If this is just kind of about making it easier to use public money for private business benefit, I think that could be very dangerous for Ford. Um, but some of these things, <clears throat> the penny may not drop until later. So I think that that accounts a little bit for the quiet reception that we're seeing at the moment. Scott, talk to me about the implications for the Liberal Party. Well, um, I think there's significant. I think there's vulnerability all around. Um, I think maybe I'll start with why I think this is happening. I think there's two or three calculations going on. I think one, um, and, and I know Corey's, because of his work in Ontario, has done a lot of polling, so maybe you'll have granular insights, concrete insights on this. I think one, if you're, the, if you're Trudeau, you sort of say, I have a choice. I can sort of stick with the traditional model. I can try to, I, I can genuinely demonize this stuff and and appear to fortify my position and demonize this stuff as as the antithesis of the system and the and the the, the thin edge of the wedge that uh, tradition has always been fought uh, against. And it's also traditionally, by the way, for the Liberal Party from an institutional standpoint, decade after decade, been held in reserve for the past 40, 50 years to uh, use as a sword when necessary in elections such as 2004 when we did it, David. Um, and I think, um, 
that pretty he, much he, every election comes that's up right. in one way or another. Pretty much every election, for sure. Sometimes it, it it's uh, a bigger sword um, mm-hmm. than others. So that's one choice. The other choice is to try to reassure people that these uh, th- that this uh, is not um, a, b- a betrayal of the system, but rather a solution to the delivery problems that we're experiencing. And I think I wonder if they're influenced by polling that says people are freaked out about um, the system. I'm not. I'm not agreeing with it. I'm just walking through what I think maybe the calculations are. I think the other calculations are you've got. Um, you got uh, Fed prop poker being played, so I think that the the temptation to have a deal with Quebec and Ontario, uh, to not have Quebec be offside, to be able to be appearing to be aligning with Quebec, I think that that's very very attractive when we think about the next election. And I think the idea of of bagging a deal, particularly by using Ontario as um, as your anchor uh, in terms of setting up Fed prop dominoes, I think is it's very so. It's almost a transactional kind of this next. So all of that kind of stuff, and all that gets skewed if I piss all over that. It's not going to kind of you know how does that play out? And then I think the third thing is the thing we talk about all the time, which is governmentitis. Because governmentitis, you know, you're going to get a shitload of memoranda that say, understand, private delivery is the anchor of the system. It's been there for all the time. It's just it's been in the universal player system. Blah 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 blah. So I, I think all of those things c- accumulate, particularly the transactional deal making. Um, and the desire to kind of bag an Ontario deal and avoid something that smells like jeopardy with Quebec. I think that's taking them all into those places. And as for, like, I mean, I don't think that Trudeau spends a lot of time worrying about what the institutional Liberal Party position has been on these things. I think we've seen time and time again, sometimes to his credit, sometimes to his disfavor, um, there's an ahistoricality about this government. So, like, you know, whatever. Like, you can talk about like that, saying- David. If I was saying I'd blow the agreement up right now and go to the polls. I don't know if I would. There's definitely more than 19% of the population that's prepared to die on this hill. I think only if it's cemented in the public view is privatization. I'm not well, sure. Well, that's, that's what a campaign about. would do. That's what you would do in the campaign. Maybe. That's what the campaign would be about. I want to talk for a moment about government regulation, something we have a fair amount of in Canada. It's complicated. There's general agreement that governments should not try to oversee and manage the economy, but there's also a natural urge to demand that governments step in when problems hit home. Supply chains are a good example. Our sponsor, CN, is perhaps the most vital link in Canada's supply chains, because just about everything moves by train. And supply chains have been gummed up worldwide for years now. War and the pandemic and changing weather have caused disruptions, which have caused shortages, which have in turn caused inflation and even higher interest rates. It's affected just about everybody. Inevitably, there have been suggestions that the solution lies with more government and more regulation, expanding the power of agencies to intervene, for example, and to exert more control over supply chain participants, to perhaps oblige railways to accept and manage more of each other's cargo, trading it back and forth across the country or forcing transportation companies to prioritize one industry's products over another. CN would respectfully suggest that our supply chain participants know their jobs better than anyone, and that more regulation would more than likely increase costs, dampen investment, and dilute service. And it says that as a railway that has moved record amounts of grain out of the prairies to domestic and foreign markets in recent months. The fact is, every link in the supply chain is at the mercy of all the other links, manufacturers, railways, shippers, truckers, ocean-going ships, and government terminals, to name several. And the only way our domestic supply chains will operate at maximum capacity is for all the players to coordinate transparently, collaboratively, and constantly. CN pledges to do just that. It is utterly committed to moving cargo and delivering it on time. Corey, um, I mentioned on Twitter that the rollout of this in Ontario has been tremendously successful from a communications perspective in that uh, the language that's being used to describe this, and I'm I'm gonna say this neutrally, is exactly what you would have wanted. And one of the examples of that is what Scott and Jordan both referred to uh, private delivery as being an important part of the pillar, uh, important part of the system already. Completely lost in that is the distinction between profit and nonprofit private delivery. And what we have mostly now is nonprofit, and what we're That's mostly going to get in the future That's... is profit. Um, so, 
um, I guess, what made, what makes this not dangerous territory for the Ford government? Because I agree with you that, I don't agree with you, I don't know what your position is, but I would say <laughs> that private delivery is not contentious as long as it's A, restricted to a relatively marginal things. I don't think people actually want surgeries happening in private clinics. Um, and the second thing is, as long as it is uh, completely paid for by by OHIP. But there's a lot of reason to believe that that isn't how it ultimately plays out. Well, there's a, there's a lot of things to talk about here. So I'll kind of take them on in order. One, not only is this is private delivery a big part of the system today, it, it is for-profit delivery, and that is virtually every family practice. Well, you're province. including doctors, right? Uh, yo, oh, why, why, why wouldn't you include doctors in a fucking health Well, because a do an right? individual like, doctor practitioner okay. is not the same okay. as shoppers. So, all right, so then let's, then let's talk about surgeries. Uh, and I'm sure you've had some polling on this too. It's quite popular, actually, when you ask people. But do you know who, uh, who brought cataracts into a private for profit delivery of removing cataracts. Only because I've heard Kathleen you say Lynn. only because Kathleen I've heard you say Lynn. it on TV several Kathleen times. Kathleen Wynn. <laughs> Kathleen Wynn did. That's who did. Kathleen Wynn did. All right. But if you want to look at diagnostics, like you go and get a blood test or any other kind of test uh, at any kind of medical facility, chances are that is a private for profit delivery of, uh, uh, of something that's an essential part of our healthcare system. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 like Life Labs is owned by Omers, for instance. Like the, the, these things are all over. If you were to remove that uh, from our healthcare system, you wouldn't have a healthcare system. Uh, so, you know, whether you're going to, you know, uh, get an MRI or, you know, you're going to a radiologist for cancer treatment or diagnostics, et cetera, et cetera, almost all of this stuff is privately delivered today. Now, how, how is it that the liberal government can say that's okay? Because everyone of every political stripe across this country is doing the same thing. They have been for a long time. And you get into very dangerous territory when you're saying, oh, no, this is the end of the world, because it doesn't actually live up to scrutiny. And so if you want to go and say, oh, we're going to campaign against private delivery, get ready to have uh, every family doctor out speaking against you. And guess who has a lot more credibility? Uh, than a politician, family doctors. I want you know, nobody. Nobody gives a shit what guys and gals like us have to say talking politics on healthcare when you know we're up against physicians, and you're going to be up against physicians across the board. You're not going to have a single hospital CEO that's going to back you up on this. You're not going to have anyone uh, with credibility in the sector who's going to say that what you're talking about is anything other than demagogic bullshit, because that's what it is. All so, right, now you know, you've just called me a demagogic bullshit. I want to pick it with Corey. So I'm going to have to. I'm going to just before Jordan. Okay. I I get the right. You know, debate rules. I get the right to respond because I've just been called a demagogic bullshitter. So, Corey, I'm just going to say in our province of Saskatchewan, when they introduced the private MRI clinics, you can get an MRI at a private clinic paid for by OHIP, right? But you, or not OHIP by the Saskatchewan Healthcare Health Association. You can also go to a private MRI clinic and pay $1,000 for an MRI. Right, right? and that's not because, what Ontario is doing. So because the deal, again, because why, the deal. Why is, it, why is it demagoguery? Because you're saying it's something uh, is happening that isn't happening. And there's, there's no, no business case. There's no business case for private delivery of health care yes, if they is. only get paid the government money. Yes, it is. only yes, works if is. there's private yes, money. Yes, there is. Yes, there is, and it's all over our system today. So you're just wrong about that. I, I hate to say it. Uh, but I'll also add, uh, in you, terms of the slurs, hypocrisy. That's the nicest because, I've ever been told it, Corey. Uh, that is the uh, <laughs> it, it's hypocrisy because you know, you're I, I know Jordan's that. going I next. I, I know Jordan's going next. But if yeah. there's a lineup to kick uh, kick uh, Corey in the nuts, could I just put my name down for third spot? <laughs> I have something okay, to say after. So Corey. I think you you are uh, you're also engaging in that a little bit here because I don't hear anybody across the country talking about removing all private delivery of healthcare. So you built yourself a real nice straw man there, and and that's not what's going on. What's happening here is I think that we're seeing you know on the policy side, which is not where I'm going to spend most of my time, but you're seeing real concern about expanding the for profit private option with public dollars. And I want to come back to the politics of this because I think, you know, one of the one of the crispest and best arguments against this is one about what are the what were the choices before the Ford government on this? 
And we're talking here about diverting significant sums of public money into a private for-profit system to take down wait lists on things like cataract surgery, hip surgery, knee surgery. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. There was a choice. You could take that money and you could invest it in the public system. For example, like most OR days end at 3 p.m. Like you could put that money in and run those ORs until 7 p.m. at night with better staffing. And the other thing I'm going to say is that these investments, good though they will be for people on those wait lists, don't do anything to relieve the crush in the emergency room, which is the crisis that a lot of people are experiencing right now. So I think that there are some great political openings to go after these things, because of course, the other thing is that it is a fact that when we start talking about putting public money into for-profit private delivery, somebody has to make profit out of it, which means that that is coming out of public money, right? So I think that you could look at what is the cost benefit, what is the missed opportunity here when that money could have been invested in the public system. And I think that you're going to see a lot of critics doing that work and putting that choice out there. Um, Please go work for Merit Styles, Jordan. Scott, what do you got? <laughs> well, I want to say this about Corey's um, argument, and I'm not, not going at his case, but I'm going to say the worst thing I think I can imagine to be said about Corey you sound like a liberal, Corey. You sound like a liberal. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why you sound like a goddamn fucking liberal. You sound like a goddamn fucking liberal because your fu- your argument right now with David is, listen, uh, let's if we want to carry this thing into the main square and have a fight, uh, I'm going to win because, one, we're right on the facts, and two, the affected stakeholders will line up with me. And that is exactly what goddamn fucking liberals say all the time when we're in government. <laughs> we go, no, 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 no. We, You guys don't understand how the system actually works and what's going to happen. And here, by the way, on the just transition, this is exactly what net zero actually means. And Our by the way, care experts say we've got we've 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 got these CEOs lined up and all this stuff. And here's the truth of the matter. This whole approach with respect to the healthcare discussion only works if there is a consensus of non-contest fundamentally among all the major participants, which is why the prime minister's positioning is so important and significant. Because if it turns into a full-fledged, let's have a Donnybrook, what conservatives always remind us, which is emotion, not cerebral appeals, and second, what people believe already is going to be what they end up believing, not what you tell them they ought to believe. That's going to take us into a world where those who say, this is the thin edge of the wedge, this will inevitably lead to the destruction of public health care, that is an inevitability. Here's two or three examples. By the way, I do have this CEO who contradicts all 99 of yours, and therefore that hospital stakeholder is now... that is. That's a complete equivalence. All of those factors that conservatives usually put to work against liberal policies that have been developed in a boardroom will be turned on you. So unless this uh, unless this sort of consensus of non-contest continues to uh, persist, this is really vulnerable to an emotional, you can call it demagogic, but it's really, uh, it's, this is really playing with matches politically, I think. Okay, so uh, here is another theory as to why the liberals and the prime minister might have uh, been more open and favorable and ge- generous in their, his comments around this. And you guys are being because maybe he's got what I have, which is a lot of polling saying it is actually quite popular <laughs> and accepted because I, I promise you. I thought you were going to say a silver uh, beard that, that women that, can't resist. <laughs> I thought you were going to say great confidence. Uh, look, uh, you know, it's not like the Ontario government just walked out and did this. Uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of looking at that. And I'm, uh, you know, and I'm going to say maybe even some of the anecdotal uh, things that uh, <laughs> David started with. I've, you know, lot, you know, how did you say, it, David? I've, you know, talked to a bunch of people, and I'm not finding my outrage uh, matched by anyone I'm yep. talking to. Well, you know, maybe, maybe we've done a lot of polling and focus testing, and maybe what actually the 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 the, the wedge on this is it sucks liberals like you guys. Uh, into fighting on something that you're, you know, you don't have popular support for, uh, and you look like you're very fucking ideological and not very practical in terms of trying to find a way to actually have healthcare work better. You know, if you keep doing the same thing, uh, and you're going to get, keep getting the same results. 
Why is it, and this is Jordan where you're wrong, I think on all the policy, and this is what people understand, if you are going to uh, have, you know, I don't know, cataracts, we'll use the Kathleen Wynne example, done 10 a day at a hospital uh, versus 100 a day in a private clinic, guess who will turn them through much more quickly and at a much lower price point? The ones that are doing 100 a day. So this is, you know, this is why it's, uh, it's being adopted by governments of every political stripe. This is why it's endorsed by healthcare administrators you know, across the province and around the country, because it's not very difficult to explain to regular people that you, know, you can push down prices by doing things in volume with people who I only do that surgery every day. Jordan can, I, Jordan, can I stop you and just take you in a slightly different direction? Uh, it's, to, it's to anybody, to be honest. But do you think that the calculation for Trudeau is that he needs a deal more than he... He needs a deal so badly that he can't afford to have this fight. That if he if if the negotiations broke down and this ended in acrimony and a fight over something like private delivery, um, would he be in worse shape than he is with just having a deal at whatever terms the provinces want to have a deal at? I think he needs to get people to the table. And so he can't blow things up at this stage. I think the bet is... Uh, that you can wait on this and deal with it if problems arise down the road uh, on his on his side. Um, but I just want to say, like, I think I, it's interesting to listen to Corey. It's always interesting to listen to Corey, but particularly on this, because I hear echoes of the same sort of a little bit of the magical thinking that we heard around the QP strike, um, which is a bit what Scott was talking about. And I think the real Real risk here is that if this is if if people begin to view this as the thin of the edge of the wedge and as privatization, you're fucked. Like that is incredibly dangerous politically. So the tightness of the rollout is not an accident. Uh, and if it you know if it manages to survive those attacks, then maybe everything Corey is saying about the polling is right and will hold. But there is absolutely an opportunity for this to turn. And I think uh, I think it's being a bit minimized. Okay. I don't think it's the thin edge of the wedge, Jordan. I think it's actually the middle part of the wedge, the part you start to feel. Um, Scott, did you have something to say about this, or are we done? I don't. I don't. I, I don't no. Okay. Let's go let's back to, to how many parts are in a wedge. Well, there's the thin ah. edge, and people talk about that as you know. And I think we're you know we're we're not right at the end, but we're at the middle. It depends uh, on where it's being put. Yeah. So if you're a long-term or even medium-term planner, you tend to want to make sure you have enough of the really vital stuff in life, well, before you run out of it. Regular listeners can guess what that stuff would be for me. Hint, it starts with an R and ends with an M, and there's only one other letter. For Canada, shipping container capacity qualifies as really vital stuff, as many of the goods we all rely on move in and out of the country in containers. Our sponsor is the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. And we've been talking the last little while about how they're proposing to build a brand new marine terminal for shipping containers at the Port of Vancouver, Roberts Bank Terminal 2. Because container capacity on the West Coast is quickly diminishing. Because trade needs are only growing in Canada, and the Port of Vancouver is a critical gateway for Canada's trade. Because it will strengthen the link between our country's businesses, big and small, and the global economy. Because the economic impact will be 17,300 well-paying jobs and $3 billion in additional GDP annually during terminal operations. And because, frankly, we've all had it up to here with supply chain issues, so scaling up right away will help connect Canadians with goods when they need them. But there's another key aspect to the long-term planning of this critical port project for Canada I want to talk about. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority's vision is for the Port of Vancouver to be the world's most sustainable port. And one way they're focusing on meeting that vision is by working with all their partners to build a zero emission port by 2050. You heard me right, the entire port community. Building and supporting low emission tech initiatives in an effort to phase out all port related emissions by 2050 is part of that vision and supports the government's goal to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority has a proven track record of building sustainable infrastructure projects, all while being a trusted partner of government, business, indigenous groups, and local communities to get the job done. Okay, we got a clipping today. 
Yeah, it was a long one. I don't know if all of you read it. I hope you did. It's a long one by Aaron Wary. I almost said Aaron Wary of McLean's because he used to be there, but I don't think we'll ever again cite a McLean's article because they don't cover politics. So uh, Aaron Wary from CBC News uh, wrote about Trudeau being at the crossroads of running again. There's a lot in this article about his motivations and the strengths and weaknesses of his government, but here's a key passage. Behind closed doors, cabinet and caucus were told to focus on four C's, competence, confidence, contrast, and campaign readiness, in that order. The first two are the most important to Trudeau's re-election chances. Governing well could boost Canadians' confidence in the government. The emphasis on contrast is readily apparent. When Trudeau and his ministers speak these days, they almost always offer some comment on what Polyev would or might do differently. Conservatives might interpret that reaction as fear. Liberals hope those differences serve to motivate progressive voters and inspire the troops. A senior liberal said Paul Lievsky's election as conservative leader has inspired a number of former government staff members and volunteers to ask about getting involved again. Based on Trudeau's comments, the fourth C isn't meant to suggest the liberals want an election sooner rather than later. An election in 2025, when the liberal NDP deal is set to expire, is a very, very solid assumption, Trudeau said. That's not entirely his decision to make, but the Liberals may need all that time to ride out an economic slowdown and build a record of new achievements they can run on after a decade in office. Um, Do you think, Scott, that this is a decisive sort of year for Trudeau to get his ducks in a row if he's going to run again? Uh, Sure, which year isn't. And, right. you know, you can talk about the CNS agreement, but the reality is that it's a minority and circumstances can conspire to force you out of government. So that that prescription, that 4C prescription would be a good one to follow in any year. It would be, you know, there's a there's a kind of a strategic arc if you can get past um, the economic turmoil of now, assuming that the other side of economic turmoil is economic uh, prosperity. Um, but we'll see. I thought there was something else about this. Like, I, I feel like when you read, uh, first of all, it's a really smart piece, really smart long form piece. Aaron's a great writer and a smart guy. But um, I think when you look at this piece overall and you and the elements that talk about Trudeau and where he's at and where his concentration is, and then you look at some of the, like, Trudeau's been doing a bit of a media blitz. He's been doing media interviews. He's been inserting messages into the public domain recently. I think when you look at it, I think we're watching a West Wing uh, moment. And I think they're sort of trying, I think there's this kind of let Trudeau be Trudeau, right? So, you know, for example, in particular, and we talked about this on an earlier pod, he's come back to this idea of Kennedy isn't broken, right? He's picked up the slogan of Polyev and used it. And I think there's a let Trudeau be Trudeau, let Bartlett be Bartlett kind of shtick going on where people might recognize that it's tactically not wise to employ your opponent's slogan. But by God, it's what gets the fire burning in his furnace. And that's what he's going. He's going to say, this is what we're all about. And and when he talks about climate change, he's, you know, and climate policy, and that's that's what animates him. And he talks about econ- uh, indigenous. That's the last refuge of losers, Scott. That's the last refuge of people that are about to fucking lose. Well, uh, that may be, but um, but I'm telling you, I think when I look at what he's talking about and where I think they're applauding themselves and saying, you can see the passion. There's this narrative of the prime minister is running again. You can see how he's gotten his juice up, partly because of Polyev, partly because some of these, Canada isn't broken. You know, an indigenous reconciliation isn't a f- broken promise for Christ's sake. Name somebody in the last 30 years. You hear this all the time, you know, you're starting to hear this. Name a more progressive government that's ever existed or, co- or ever could for the love of fuck. So you're getting this kind of, <laughs> let Trudeau be Trudeau. You're, I think that's, I think that, you know, take Aaron's, I, I'm certain that someone stood up at that cabinet retreat and said, here's the four C's, but I think let Trudeau be Trudeau. I think West Wing is what's really driving the moment we're in right now. And I think there's evidence of it almost every day. We're having a cabinet retreat in the next two days here as we record this. I bet we're going to get more of this at the microphones. Can I, can I just jump in? Because this is like my worst pet peeve. Uh, is when people quote fucking West Wing as if it's political strategy. You know That's, what isn't the political strategy? Uh, having Aaron Sorkin tell you how to win a campaign. I like, agree. Is, That's my. That's really the embedded dumb. joke really in it dumb. all. 
really don't. Corey, the, liberal uh, staffer is engaging in, uh, in political cosplay. It's perfect. Yeah, right? yeah, well, yeah. I guess for, for him. Uh, you have uh, not watched look, I, me walk down a hallway with pleated pants, rattling off statistics <laughs> and witty crackerjack jokes with ease. Yes, well, I, I, I can believe with you. But uh, look, I, I, I first of all, uh, I think I think it's a really, really smart, very, uh, very good piece that's well worth the the time it takes to to plow through it. Uh, a lot, a lot of good stuff in there. But I think it touches on on the fundamental question: like, wh- what is it that this government uh, is going to present, both as as uh, as a record, you know, in terms of its accomplishments, but also what are what are the problems that it's going to address going forward? Like we've talked about many times, campaigns are about the future more than the past, and I think in all cases. What is it that you're going to what is it that you're going to do? Like there's a bit of a sense with this government and, and there's lots of comparisons to Harper in 2015 in, in the article. And I think they're they're pretty valid uh, where, you know, you get a bit tired when you've been in government for a while. And the clarity and the focus that you had in your campaign and your messaging on the way in. Uh, kind of gets gets diminished a bit, and you know one of the points that Weary makes again and again in the piece is a lot of the attacks that found fertile ground uh, for for Trudeau in 2015 against Harper uh, could be leveled against Trudeau in 2023 with equal effect and equal intuitive appeal to voters and uh, and to the media. Like I, I think you, you know, still believe be- that better is possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. It, <laughs> Uh, reality and government can grind you down uh, and and make the simplistic solution set on the campaign trails and opposition leader uh, a little bit uh, a little bit tougher to go out and sell and market and and to even believe in yourself. So, you know, I, I just think there's a lack of sharpness and a lack of contrast. You talk about contrast, you know, it it's tough. You know? And I think on some of the issues where they are, you know, and we've talked about this before, saying Canada isn't broken. I think it's very very dumb way to respond to. Uh, to Polyev's attack in that area, I don't think it's intuitively, uh, you know, good for him either. To you know, if you don't think uh, Canada's broken in some way, why are you fucking apologizing all the time for it? Like, there's a whole bunch of things that just don't line up super well in terms of their message track around that. But you know, I, I think the message track that got them there in 2015 uh, could be leveled against them with with I think pretty devastating effect if if communicated properly. Jordan, in addition to whatever else you wanted to say about this, contrast as part of the thing. Like, it takes me back to this healthcare issue. How is Trudeau? How is Trudeau's Delacorte position different than what Polyev's position will be on healthcare? And it's how is not. that ever sustainable for the Liberal Party? It's not. And actually, that I I wanted to talk about contrast, and I'm really glad you chose this particular passage to highlight because I think the whole article is really good and worth a read. But that was that was the one passage in it that kind of made me like grown, right? Like, because I I think that, you know, perhaps there's an internal story that they're doing a lot of contrast and that this is really enmeshed and to how they're communicating. But I think that the practice shows the complete opposite. And, you know, that's a great example. If you, if you hold up Pierre Polyev's comments and Trudeau's comments uh, on what Ford is doing, Polyev sounds more critical. He sounds more critical. He was expressing more concerns than Trudeau was last week. Uh, so, you know, I think the prime minister has not integrated that necessarily. But, you know, I, I was also forced to think back to some of the conversations we were having, you know, in the summer and late in the fall. These guys missed months of contrast with Polyev. They sat on their hands. They've sat on their hands on defining him. They sat on their hands and defining him all through the leadership race, all through his early months in leadership. Uh, so this is not a government that has a real strong commitment to contrast through and through. And and I don't think that despite what they may tell themselves about that, there's really no evidence that they're deploying that in, in sort of a disciplined or rigorous or strategic way. So to me, that was a that was a piece that um, maybe is a little bit telling in terms of where the internal story differs from what's actually kind of popping out the other side. And the other thing I was just going to highlight, it really goes to what Corey was talking about, and that's the the tension I think that Aaron does a really great job of highlighting between legacy and future vision and action. Um, And and you do really see that push and pull in the story that for all 
you know, he makes maybe, them seem backward looking more than forward. That's right. And I think it's it's so interesting that in that piece, you know, the prime minister himself is is like self-aware on that and yet kind of cannot help himself uh, and, and can, sort of talks in terms of legacy and talks in terms of that record. And like that's it's just deadly. Right. Because the minute voters, I think, feel like this is a government that already struggles to connect to the reality of the struggles people are facing. Right. Like we've talked time and time again. uh about how they just can't seem to evoke that sense of empathy on cost of living and affordability. And they really are, are not doing a great job there. And, and then when you layer on top of that, that they are sort of making that constant backwards case that like, but we're doing so great. We've done so much. We are not broken. We are, you know, this is, this is really the root of the issue, I think. And if the prime minister is not able to find some clarity and some passion around what the future vision is, what the future offer to voter is, voters is, uh, I think they're in real, real trouble. And so for me, this piece was great uh, because I think it teases out all those threads in a really compelling way. Yeah, for sure. Hey, listen, we've had an hour fly by. We've got to call in Gordon Pinson, get this thing wrapped up here. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. Okay. Who's my volunteer to go first today? Okay, well, I'm going to be a warm-up act for Corey because I know he's got a good one. Uh, my hey you this week goes out to Daniel Smith's staffers. So I don't expect a lot from Daniel Smith. Uh, this whole business with prosecutors on the COVID stuff, it is, that's bad, but, but you know, with well within the realm of the... Uh, complete nonsense that we've come to expect from her premiership. But if you are a staffer in a premier's office and someone tells you to email a crown prosecutor about charges and you do it, you need to, you need to quit. You need to stop. You need to never do that. Why are you doing that? So this is a hey you that goes out to Daniel mm -hmm. Smith's staff, but also to anyone who is in a position with any elected official, if you ever so much as have the inkling, the thought, the idea to pick up the phone or to compose an email, and it is to a Crown prosecutor or to the police about an ongoing case or an investigation or charges, do not ever do it. And I can't believe we have to say that, but here we are. <clears throat> here, here. All right. Scott. No, no, no. I'm going to play cleanup. Uh, oh, are you? Okay. All right. We've been, it's been billed and advertised. We need to hear from Corey first. All right. Well, uh, mine is uh, going out to uh, Frank Graves, sometimes friend of the podcast, uh, pollster, well-known folk, uh, person in our circles, uh, because I think uh, he needs to be called out on, uh, on a repeated bad behavior that he has exhibited over a number of years. Uh, you know, Frank is, uh, uh, you know, uh, older guy. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that maybe he doesn't understand when you, when you write something on the internet, it's there forever. You can't just wake up in the morning and delete, uh, inappropriate things that you write, uh, in the wee hours of the morning, uh, uh when your judgment is clouded by God knows what, but, uh, our friend Frank has had a habit of taking a run at a, a friend of ours on the podcast, uh, Jenny Byrne. Uh, many times uh, and saying some things that I think are just completely indefensible, uh, like asking her whether or not she exchanges boudoir stories with Pierre Polyev's wife because she used to date him, uh, which I'll point that one out. He said many, but this is you know one of his many that he's deleted, uh, which I think is you know extremely sexist. It's uh, trying to uh, you know indicate that. Uh, uh, you know, who Jenny has had a relationship with or, or, or her gender is somehow why she's running Pierre's campaign, as opposed to the fact that she's, for instance, the only living campaign manager who won a conservative majority government. Maybe that's why she's there. Uh, anyway, I, I find this stuff really, you know, bad. And if, uh, if Frank didn't have his own company, he would have been fired long, long ago uh, for these antics that he gets into late at night uh, on, on the Twitter machine. So I'm going to suggest that, hey, Frank, maybe you ought to put a time lock uh, on, your, uh, on your Twitter account, or maybe you should install a breathalyzer on it. But whatever you need to do, you should do it because you're not doing yourself or any of us any favors by debasing our political debate in that kind of way. It's really unbecoming. And I even made a little sign. I don't know if you guys can see it. 
but it's uh, there in the background. Don't drink, Don't and, drink tweet. and tweet. Yeah. Sound yeah, advice. A bad idea. Idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I have, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to have to echo you, uh, Corey. I, I've known Frank a long time. I consider him a personal friend and, and I think he's very, very smart at what he does, but after 11 o'clock, it's just no good. And some of the stuff with respect to Jenny is inappropriate completely. Uh, yeah, and I'm on the same page. Uh, I like Frank, but I got to say, time and time and time again, you wake up at six o'clock in the morning, you take a look at the Twitter feed, and you just say to yourself, it's not over the line, it's not darting with the line, it's revolting and not cool, and it's abusive. Uh, it's got to stop. My Hey You is inspired by an event that occurred 17 years to the day, uh, which uh, a few of us will remember, I suspect. That's the day of the 2006 federal election when Paul Martin lost. Really? Is this that fucking anniversary? Yeah. Oh my God, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know. And fuck fuck you for reminding me. Today is, today is it. Well, but, and that's what inspires my Hey You, um, because no matter what you think about the arc of that election and its outcome, when uh, Paul Martin's uh, time as prime minister ended and Stephen Harper's began, um, I will say this, that election turned and, and because it's, our podcast, and we get to say, and others can quarrel, that election turned on the actions of RCMP Giuliano Zaccardelli. And I'm just going to remind you, okay, here's a little bit. Zaccardelli was at the center of the Maharar affair, the rendition of Maharar, as revealed through a judicial inquiry, right? He was subjected to withering scrutiny, over the abuse of pension and insurance funds from the RCMP and at those committee hearings, public committee hearings, worked hard to throw his deputies under the bus after litany of them coming forward, talking about his abuse. And of course, he intervened in the 2006 election with absolute abandon, instructing that a press release be sent out, instructing that it be sent uh, to uh, Judy Wischelos's Lee, I can never say her goddamn name, her, uh, her her office. And of course, he himself personally intervened with his own staff to rewrite the press release so that it named our uh, friend uh, Ralph Goodale. You are a fuck. You are a withering, no good fuck, Zachardelli. I don't know where you are today, this 17 years later, but I hope you have a shit day. I hope you're wallowing in the piss that is your disgraced career, and I really, really, really don't forgive you. I thought I was harsh. Jesus. Christ, I don't even want to go after that. I don't. I, I don't. But uh, but yeah, I do I have. You, I hope yours is light today, David. <laughs> yeah, I do have to. I do have to go. I will obviously echo everything Scott said. Certainly, could not have been my fault. <clears throat> and um, so, uh, my hey you goes out to uh, uh, two people: uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and uh, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. My hey you to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is: this is the wrong policy that you are pursuing on health care. Private delivery, for-profit delivery will ultimately end up in a private payer system. It will be the end of single payer in Canada at some point. And this will be a, a, a turning point in that time of history. So don't do it. Rethink it. Second thing is, as leader of the Liberal Party, as I said, you've thrown away 50 years of positioning. Election after election after election has been won because Canadians identified with how liberals thought about Medicare and not how conservatives thought about Medicare. And that is in danger of disappearing as well. And so in your position as leader of the Liberal Party, don't do that either. So in both of your hats, please reconsider what you said to Susan Delacourt. And let's have a different discussion at the Premier's table about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable going forward. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you guys for joining me for a spirited discussion about big fucking hairy shit that we were talking about today. And I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsors, CN Rail and the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. I'd like to thank everybody who watched or listened to the show today. And we'll be back next week with more Curse of Politics. We'll see you then. Stay safe. <laughs>